Welcome back to ECE 501B. Today I'm greeting you with quite a few assignments. Homework 4 is due Thursday, the next Thursday is homework 5, and the next Monday is homework 6. And those will be dealing with eigenvalues and eigenvectors and inner products which are topics for exam number two, which is two weeks from Wednesday, I believe the 2nd of November. We're, wow, we're halfway through October. And so we need to be thinking about exam number two, and I will try to get material available or on the website to help you review for exam number two. But it will be material subsequent to exam one, but it's still somewhat cumulative in terms of the material because of the very nature of all of these chapters building on each other. Today what I want to do is continue with chapter six, and chapter six was dealing with inner product spaces, which is a vector space together with an inner product. And once we have an inner product, we can start thinking about lengths and angles. And the length we can use to define a norm. And the angle we can now think about using it to talk about orthogonality. When our inner product is zero, then our vectors in that vector space can be considered orthogonal. Once we have that concept down, we can actually decompose a vector in, in terms of another vector and say, oh, get the component in the direction of the other vector and then another component that's orthogonal or perpendicular to that vector. That's this orthogonal decomposition. And now we will start introducing more acronyms. First is CSI, and you've probably watched all of the programs on TV about CSI. The different No, this is the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, but we're going to abbreviate it CSI. And that's now going to lead us into this concept of angle relative to an inner product, where the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality is the absolute value of the inner product is less than or equal to the norms of the two vectors in the inner product. So it's a bounding inequality or operation. We could use then the definition or the property of absolute value and write the second equation there and say that the inner product is now bounded between the negative most value and the positive most value. And we will use that to, if we divide everything or all terms by the norm of u and the norm of v, now this inner product divided by the norm of u norm of v is bounded between minus 1 and 1. And we can think of an angle's cosine as being bounded between minus 1 and 1. And that allows us now to think about this inner product producing something that we can then associate with an angle. Another inequality that we will work with in this class and we will discuss or present today is the triangle inequality. And these are not difficult concepts in terms of drawing a two-dimensional picture, but now we are able to extend these ideas, these intuitive pictures, into higher dimensional spaces. And that allows us then to say that the norm of the sum of two vectors is less than or equal to the norm or the sum of the norms of those two vectors. That's the triangle inequality. We will then talk about envelopes. I, I'm sorry, the par parallelogram equality. Now I'm wanting you to think about the back of an envelope. Well, that's maybe with orthogonal angles, but if we skew it a little bit, we have these lines that connect the two corners of our parallelogram and that will be able to relate with this parallelogram equality, this relationship on norms. Breath on our goal list and we haven't even got through our goal list. We then are going to talk about an orthonormal basis. What do we mean by 
vectors being orthonormal, and then we will talk about the Gram-Schmidt process, which allows us to create these orthonormal lifts. I hope you now have your seat belts buckled. That's where we're going relative to chapter number six. Here's what we've already talked about. Scrolling through, we have inner product spaces. Again, that's a vector space with an inner product. And the inner product is a way of taking two vectors from that vector space and mapping them into a scalar. That's the definition of the inner product or one of the higher level ways of thinking about an inner product. But an inner product, in order to be a valid inner product, has to satisfy these different properties. And those properties are positivity. If you have a vector, and you have a valid inner product, then that inner product, when taken of a vector with itself, has to be non-negative. Definiteness means that if you look at, or if any vector gives you an inner product equal to zero, then the vector has to be the zero vector. That's the definiteness property. Additivity in the first slot, that allows us now to separate an inner product into pieces if we have a summation in the first slot and that separation is very clean in terms of its structure. Homogeneity in the first slot is similar. We can now factor out a scaled version of the first vector and that just slides right out of the inner product because of this homogeneity in the first slot. And any of these properties if somebody is proposing an inner product and you can show that that proposed inner product violates any of these properties, then there is a argument against their proposed inner product actually being a valid inner product. And some of the homeworks or exam questions might be addressing that particular issue. And the last property is conjugate symmetry, which says if we interchange the vector ordering in the inner product, we then need to take the complex conjugate of that inner product. Those are the properties of an inner product. Again, the inner product is taking two vectors from our vector space and producing a scalar, and that operation needs to satisfy these one, two, three, four, five properties of an inner product. We then talked about defining a norm where independent of the definition of the inner product, we simply take the square root of that result and that will be the norm of a vector. And we're assured of that answer of the inner product by the first property of our positivity of that being a positive number so it has a valid square root can also then look at what happens if we scale a vector and if we look at the square of the norm of that scaled vector and just apply some of our inner product properties the norm is just the inner product of the vector or the norm squared is the inner product of the vector with itself that's AU AU or bracket AU AU first property that we're using to achieve that equality. What have we done? We've simply slid the first slot's scalar, and so that's homogeneity, homogeneity of the first slot to achieve that equality. What about the next equality? So that's the conjugate homogeneity of the second slot, which then now we have A times its conjugate, and if you have a complex number times its conjugate, what does that yield? That's A plus JB times A minus JB. That's A squared plus B squared, or that's the square of the magnitude of that complex number. 
which is the next equality, and the inner product of a vector and itself is just the definition of the norm squared. So we see that if we have this scaled vector, AU, we can also think of that as factoring out the absolute value of that scalar and squaring it, and that will then scale the original vector's squared norm. Orthogonality simply means that the inner product of those two vectors produces a zero, a scalar zero, and orthogonal decomposition, which is what we will start with today, is I'm just identifying it, but we'll show where this comes from. We're now breaking a vector u into two pieces. One piece that lies along another vector v, and the second piece of u is orthogonal to that vector v. And we are going to show how we can come up with this scalar A that I have shown or tried to highlight with this dashed emphasis around the inner product of UV divided by the norm squared of V. But this is also a way of thinking about this inner product. The inner product of U and V is really sort of saying what part of U aligns with V, and that's coming out of the inner product and then we're scaling that by this v squared. Or we now have u is equal to some vector plus another vector where the first vector is the component of u along v and the second component is the component of u that's perpendicular to v. And let's then look at that now as to where does this come from or how can we actually convince ourselves that this scaling or this scalar A is indeed the inner product divided by this norm squared. And that's this topic of orthogonal decomposition. Here we're going to start with two vectors. And those two vectors we will just call U and V. And we want to know how can we write the vector u in terms of v and another vector w where this other vector w is in fact a vector that's perpendicular to the first vector v. I'm a big proponent in if I'm trying to figure something out let me just draw it and maybe visually it will start to help me understand what I'm talking about or thinking about and here let's say that we start with a vector u a generic vector u, and we start with another vector, and let's call that vector v. What we're wanting to do is actually project u, or take, or basically break u into two pieces. One piece that is in the same direction as V and the other piece that's orthogonal to V. And if we now drop a perpendicular down from U to V, we can now look at this scaled version of V where this is now a scalar A times the vector V. And we now have this, if we thought of that being that length, then we need to attach another vector, which we're calling W, to the head of AV. The tail of W now will get us from AV to the final point, which is U. And we want to now find this 
scalar A that will allow this to happen. We can now decompose any vector in terms of another vector. That's the idea. And that A is going to be a scalar. So we're going to let A be in our field. And we want to now write U as... And here I'm going to be a little bit silly with what I'm saying. I'm going to write U as U. Meaning, I'm going to say, let's take AV plus U minus AV. So now U is equal to U. But what I'm really wanting to do is say, I want to create or define this part as my new vector w, and in order to make this w fit the picture, this two-dimensional picture, I need w or a to actually allow this vector v to be orthogonal to w, to be consistent with the picture. And that's the goal. The goal, then, is to find this scalar A that makes V and U minus AV orthogonal to one another. And this U minus AV, just to give us something to think about, we've been calling that W. And that's how we could then do an orthogonal decomposition of the vector U. What we want then is we want the vector V to be orthogonal to the vector W, and W is related to U and V by this scalar A. And if V is perpendicular or orthogonal to U minus AV, then what do we know about those two vectors V and W. If V is perpendicular or orthogonal to W, what do we know has to happen with respect to chapter 6 topics? The inner product is going to be 0. And we can then say that we want W inner product with V or bracket W V we want that to equal zero. But W is parameterized in terms of U and V. Let's now put that parameterized form of W into our inner product. And we now have U minus AV with V, and we want that to equal zero. We can simplify that. Now we have a combination of vectors in the first slot, and what do we know about the first slot's additivity property? Now we can break that into two different inner products. We have an inner product of U with V, and we'll subtract, we'll pull out that negative, the inner product of AV with V. And that now needs to be zero. We haven't done anything wrong. We just used the additivity of the first slot to obtain this next line equation. When we're trying to solve for A, it'd be nice if we could isolate A. And how can we sort of get A out of that first slot? Homogeneity of the first slot. So the homogeneity of the first slot allows us to say, have the inner product of U and V minus A times the inner product of V with itself. But this we can write as the norm squared. 
And in so writing, we can now actually solve for A. If we're assuming that V is non-zero, then we can divide all the terms by the norm of V squared, and isolating A allows us to say then that A, in order to, to allow V and W to be orthogonal, A needs to be such that the inner product of U, it's equal to the inner product of U with V divided by norm of V squared. So we've now shown that if we decompose a vector u into pieces using the vector v, then we can find the component of u along v as u inner product with v divided by the norm of v squared times v. This is now our scalar a. and the remaining piece of u is going to be the component that's orthogonal to v, and that's u minus a times v, where, again, a is the inner product of u with v divided by the norm of v squared times v. as a picture, here could be V, and here could be U. We now have decomposed U in terms of pieces of V, or an orthogonal decomposition of U. We now have this piece being AV, and this piece getting us to the tip of U is now U minus a, B, where A is this component of U in the direction of V scaled by V squared. Or if you wanted to think about how do we get U minus A, V, you could say, well, if I walk up U, so now pretend that I'm walking up U, and I add to that minus AV, but minus AV is just parallel to AV in the opposite direction, so that now I can simply come down here. What do I have left? That's now, in fact, what I wanted, which was U minus AV as a vector. And that's exactly the same if I'd drawn properly or correctly this piece down here is the vector u minus a v. We now know how to orthogonally decompose a vector in terms of another vector what vector is, or which part is in the same direction, just scaled of the other vector and a component that's orthogonal to the other vector. Let's now talk about CSI, or this is now Theorem 615, which is the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. question. So the question was, have we done anything with projections? Yes, we've projected a piece of U onto V, but not all of U is on V unless they're aligned. But we have projected one piece of U onto V and then the other piece of U is orthogonal to V. So we're taking the piece of U that's aligned with V, and so that's the projection of U onto V, 
and then we have to move orthogonal to V to pick up the rest or what we need to get to the actual starting vector U. So you can think of this inner product as finding the component of U in the direction of V. That's what this inner product is doing and we're scaling that by this V squared or the norm of V squared to get this scaling factor A and that will allow us then to decompose U into orthogonal pieces, orthogonal defined by the U and V vectors and we can now orthogonally decompose U in terms of a piece that's aligned with V and another piece that's orthogonal to V. Let's now look at the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Here, let's say that we now start again with two vectors in our underlying vector space V. Then, using an inner product, we can show that the absolute value of the inner product of U with V is in fact less than or equal to the norm of U times the norm of V. And we can actually ensure the equality of that inequality with equality if and only if the vectors U and V are scalar multiples. They're aligned if and only if U and V are scalar multiples. Or you could think of the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality in terms of having two different pieces or bounding its lower side and its upper side by using the definition or the property of absolute values, which means that we can look at the negative of the norm of U times the norm of V being less than or equal to the inner product of U with V, which is less than or equal to the norm of U times the norm of V. So we can look at the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Usually it's written in the compact form in the first line, but sometimes it's helpful for other purposes to expand the absolute value property and write it as the second blue expression. Let's look at how we can show that in fact this Cauchy-Schwarz inequality is true. Again, we're still keeping U and V as vectors in our vector space. Is it clear that if the vector V was the zero vector that that inequality would be true? If we replaced in that inequality V with zero, the zero vector, what are we going to get on the left? zero because zero is orthogonal to any vector and what do we get on the right? What's the norm of zero? Zero times anything is zero so we get zero equals zero if we let if V is equal to zero both sides are zero and so that verifies or validates that inequality. It's true if V is zero. So let's look at the less trivial case. Suppose that V is not equal to zero. Well, one of the reasons we were talking about this previous material of orthogonal decomposition and Pythagorean theorem, now we can start using those facts to prove more and more interesting theorems, which the first interesting theorem is the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. So if V is not equal to zero, we can decompose U in terms of V and W. 
w is also going to belong in our vector space and we will force a particular relationship between v and w and that particular relationship is that we want those two to be orthogonal. And we know how to do that from our earlier results. So this inner product of w with v being zero is just telling us that w is orthogonal or perpendicular to v. We can now say that, well, we can now write u as a, which is u inner product with v divided by the norm of v squared times v plus w, and w is now orthogonal to v. We know this scaling or this decomposition of u will allow w to be orthogonal to v based on our previous orthogonal decomposition result. Now what we want to realize is that v is orthogonal to w, or we now have u made up of a sum of two vectors, and those two vectors are orthogonal. That's now screaming at us the Pythagorean theorem. Can we now apply the Pythagorean theorem? which says that if we look at the square of u's norm, and u we can write as a v plus w squared, now we have this two vectors, x plus y, norm squared. Well, by Pythagorean, we know that that's the norm of x squared plus the norm of y squared. And x, in this case, is a, which is inner product of uv with v squared times v. That's now our norm of x squared. And y, the norm of y squared, y is just our w squared. That's our A piece. But we know how to simplify a scaled vector norm squared by one of the earlier properties that we looked at at the beginning of class today. What happens when I now try to get that A out from underneath the norm squared? It's going to be taking the absolute value of a and squaring it, isn't it? And then that can be factored out of the norm of that scaled vector squared. Or we now take the absolute value of a, which is uv inner product scaled by v squared, and square it. We're now left with v inner product with v plus the norm of w squared, this piece right there can be written as v squared, or the norm of v squared. Or we now have the norm of u squared is a squared, absolute value, times v squared plus w squared. But we have some norm of v squareds appearing in that first term on the right side of the equality. We actually have the norm squared of v squared downstairs. We can cancel one of those with what's upstairs, the norm of v squared. And we're left then with the absolute value of the inner product of u and v squared divided by the norm of v squared. And what do we know about this piece right there? 
that's a vague question, but in terms of if W is non-zero, which we're assuming U and V are not aligned, then if W is non-zero, what do we know about that piece in terms of its property relative to an inner product? If we take the norm of a vector and square it, what do we know has to be true about that scaled or that scalar that results? It's non-negative, isn't it? By the inner pro positivity of the inner product. This is now than or equal to zero by the positivity of the inner product. So if I throw it away, what do I know now needs to be replacing that equality sign if I now want on the left to keep u squared on the left? If I've now thrown something away up from the right side, what do I know is true about the left side in terms of its relationship with the right side if I've now discarded the norm of W squared? So I know that the right side has to be less than or equal to the left side. And I can now multiply both sides. by the norm of v squared and that now gives me the norm of u squared times the norm of v squared is greater than or equal to the absolute value of the inner product of u with v squared and to make it more consistent with the Cauchy-Schwarz statement earlier I can just interchange the ordering of that and if I put the inner product and if I take the square root of both sides I now have the absolute value of the inner product of u and v being less than or equal to the norm of u times the norm of v. And we were able to do all of that without needing to really select a particular inner product. We didn't have to identify a particular inner product, we just had to know that it was an inner product and satisfied the inner product property. This proof then required no definition of inner product and we didn't have to, well, we simply needed to use some of our properties. We had to orthogonally decompose a vector, and then we had to realize that we enjoy this positivity property of an inner product, and that allowed us then to prove this cauchy schwarz inequality. And if we look at the property of the absolute value, then we can look at saying, well, we can lower bound the inner product on the left by looking at negative norm of u times norm of v. And that's now less than or equal to the norm of, I'm sorry, the inner product of u and v. And that's now less than or equal to the norm of u times the norm of V. But if U and V are non-zero, then their norms are non-zero, and I can divide every term by that same value or quantity, norm of U times the norm of V. Doing that on the left, I'm left with minus 1. In the middle, I now have the inner product of U and V divided by the norm of u and the norm of v, and on the right, I have 1. And we know that an angle's cosine, we can think of that as being bounded between minus 1 and 1, so we could think of this as 
that scalar in between those bounds of minus 1 and 1, we can associate that with the cosine of theta. And we can now think of this as the angle or associated with the angle between the vector u and the vector v. Question. So the question was, there are other functions that we can find that are bounded between, that have bounds of 1 and minus 1. Is there any particular reason for selecting cosine? And the reason I would give is now we can think of this quantity, inner product of uv divided by the norm of uv, as associated with an angle. It gives us a fair amount of insight maybe in thinking about this, especially in a two or three dimensional set. So it's really the, the benefit of having this as an angle property of this inner product. So we are now going to say that let's let the cosine of theta be the inner product of u and v equaling or I'm sorry, cosine of theta is equal to the inner product of uv divided by the norm of u and the norm of v, or, and maybe you've seen this, we can now multiply both sides by the norm of u with v, and we now have the norm of u times the norm of v times the cosine of theta is now the inner product of u and v. And you've maybe seen that way of looking at an inner product in two-dimensional settings, where now the norms could be thought of as lengths, and you now have the length of u times the length of v times the cosine of the angle between them is going to give you this inner product of u with v. Let's now look at another inequality which is the triangle inequality. Here again we are going to start with two vectors, u and v, in our vector space. And now we are going to look at another inequality that can be shown to be true. And that is that the norm of the sum of those two vectors is less than or equal to the sum of the norms of those two vectors. And we actually have equality if and only if the two vectors u and v are non-negative scalar multiples. Again, you're wanting them to be aligned, in a sense. So let's see where this, or how we can demonstrate the validity of this inequality. Suppose, again, that we're starting with these two arbitrary vectors, u and v, in the vector space v. And let's just start with, and sometimes it's easier to work with norm squared versus the norm. Gets rid of that square root. <laughs> so now if we look at the norm squared of u, the sum of u and v, What's another way of writing that? Forget u plus v and just put an x in there. How would we write the norm of x squared in terms of chapter 6 topic? It's going to just be the inner product of x with itself, isn't it? In this case, we can say, oh, 
u plus v norm squared is simply u plus v inner product with u plus v. Well, now we have summations everywhere, but luckily we have additivity properties of both the first slot and the second slot. Let's do this in stages. Let's use the additivity of the first slot to rewrite this as a sum of two inner products. We can now say that this is u inner product with u and v plus the inner product of v with u and v. And now we have the second slot containing a addition of two vectors. But that can be what do we know about the additive properties of the second slot? Do we have to worry too much about that? Is it a straight additivity or do we have to do something special? What happens to the second slot when we put a sum in there? Did we show last time, I think, it's just a straight additivity, isn't it? Additivity of the second slot. If we do that on the first inner product, we then have u inner product with itself plus the inner product of u with v. And now we can, so that's separating the first term on the right of, in blue into two pieces. We can separate the second term in blue using additivity of the second slot. And that's now going to be inner product of v with u and the inner product of v with itself. But here, let me actually rewrite this piece. If I wanted to interchange change u and v, or my slot locations, or the vectors in the slot, can I just write that down? It needs to be the complex conjugate. We haven't said anything about what these vectors are or what fields we're dealing with, so now we have to use the conjugate symmetry of the inner product. And I can now say that I have u and u. Let me pull that fourth term next, which is v inner product with itself. And then the last two terms, let me make that be u and v and u and v conjugate. What's the inner product of u with itself? Another way of writing that. That's the norm of u squared, norm of v squared. And what happens if I take a complex number and add to that its conjugate? I have a plus jb plus a plus minus jb. What happens? The conjugates cancel, and I'm just left with twice the real component. So I can rewrite this, the last two terms, as 2 times the real of the inner product of u and v. Are we okay with that? Again, all of this is equal to the norm of u plus v squared. But now I want to bound this. I'm trying to find a triangle inequality. And really what I would like on the right-hand side is a perfect square of u squared plus v squared. But I have this funny term of 2 times the real of uv, but now think of what happens when I have a complex number. So what happens when we have a complex number 
and we look at the real piece of that. Is it shorter than the whole number itself, the complex number? So if we had A plus JB, is A less than the magnitude of A plus JB? A and B are orthogonal, or they will be with the J in there. So what I'm suggesting is that if we use the fact that we're not doing anything with the first two terms, but now I want to say that I can introduce this inequality by saying that I'm now having this is twice the magnitude of the inner product of u and v, where here I'm actually using, or to introduce that inequality, of using the real part of z is now less than or equal to the magnitude of z. But I can make that inequality even stronger, so to speak, because I can now bound the absolute value of u, the inner product of u and v, with CSI, the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. I can now say that this is less than or equal to, and what was on the left? This was still our plus v squared, and on the right, I have u squared plus v squared, but by the Cauchy-Schwarz, I can say with the magnitude of the inner product of u and v is less than or equal to the norm of u times the norm of v. And this is from Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. But now what I have on the right looks nice. I've now essentially produced a perfect square on the right. I can now rewrite this as the norm of u plus the norm of v, that quantity squared. Or I now have the norm of u plus v squared is less than or equal to the norm of u plus the norm of v squared, and I can take the square root of both sides to give me my triangle inequality, which is now the norm of u plus v is less than or equal to the norm of u plus the norm of v. And again, I didn't have to specify a particular inner product. I just used properties of the inner product. I had no particular definition of an inner product in order to demonstrate that validity of the triangle inequality. And it's called the triangle inequality for a reason. And that reason comes to us from our two-dimensional understanding. And that is if I have two sides of a triangle, let's say one side is U and the other side is V, I know that the length of the sum of those to vectorially is going to be less than the length of u plus the length of v, unless they're aligned. So this now says that the length of u plus v is less than or equal to the length of u plus the length of v meaning if I laid the length of u down on top of u plus v and then added the length of v, I'm obviously bigger 
than the length of u plus v. And the only way to get those to be the same is if u and v were exactly on top of each other in terms of u and v. Now, we've looked at CSI and TI, didn't call it TI, triangle inequality and Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Let's get rid of these inequalities and talk about an equality for a chain. And this is now going to be the parallelogram equality. So all of these are just screaming at us to have these visualizations, triangle, parallelogram, good thing we took our geometry classes seriously when we were younger, right? So now let's look at the parallelogram, and this is now an equality. And sometimes we can use this equality to show a relationship on norms, hint, hint. That might be important in one of your homework problems. Or it might allow you to immediately conclude that somebody's proposed norm or yeah norm definition isn't valid because it doesn't satisfy this parallelogram equality. So again, let's start with two vectors u and v in our vector space capital V, and this now says that the norm squared of u plus v plus the norm squared of u minus v is in fact equal to twice the norm of u squared plus the norm of v squared. And maybe it's nicer in terms of where in the world did this parallelogram inequality or equality come from, let's draw a picture. And then that will maybe help you understand another way of thinking about or remembering this equality. And again, that's an equality, and here's the picture. Suppose that I now have a vector u, and let's say a vector v, and I add that onto u. And where's the vector u plus v? That's the tail of u to the head of v, isn't it? So now I can just go this way. And this is u plus v. And now, if I think about this a little bit, suppose that I now, well, this piece right here, That's still v, is it not, as far as a vector is concerned? And what do I want to say now? Suppose that I now start up here, and I want to go now minus v. Where would that return me to? That goes back to the very first place that I started. So now this piece right here is what I'm calling minus v. And if I add that now to u, do you see that I get over to right here? So if I now add u with minus v, starting up in that upper left-hand corner, I've now gone u minus v, or I've gone from here to there, and maybe I shouldn't have labeled my u plus v where I did. That's maybe confusing things. So let me put that one somewhere else. Let me call that u plus v. And this is now u minus v. Is that okay? And another way to see that, or to here's u, right there is u, and then I could just go minus v again and get back to the same place. And what have I done? I now have this parallelogram with the diagonals 
being these quantities, u plus v and u minus v. And what's the parallelogram rule or equality telling us? That's telling us that if I take the length of one of those diagonals, u plus v, its norm, I shouldn't say length, let me take the norm of u plus v and square it, add to that the norm of u minus v and square that, that's now the same as taking the four sides of that parallelogram and squaring those norms. So I'm walking around the perimeter, I have the norm of u squared plus the norm of v squared, and double it, and that gives me 2 u squared plus v squared. Well, this equality is saying I have the norm of the diagonals, their norms squared added up, is equal to the perimeter's norms squared. Just a way of thinking about that equality, given any two vectors u and v. Let's now see if we can prove that in fact that equality is valid. So now we're again starting with two vectors, u and v, and we have u plus v squared plus the norm of u minus v squared. And what is that? Well, the norm squared is an inner product of the vector with itself. And I'm now doing that two different places. Or I have now u plus v's inner product with u plus v. That takes care of the first one squared. And the second one squared is now the inner product of u minus v with itself. Are we okay so far? And now we can just play fast and loose with this additivity of the different slots, right? So if we do that in stages, I can now look at the first one. I have u inner product with u plus v, and I have v inner product with u plus v. Let me switch colors to take care of the next one. I now have u inner product with u minus v. And let me go then and pull that minus sign out by the homogeneity of the first slot and say I have minus v inner product with u minus v. And if I now use the additivity of the second slot, I have u inner product with itself plus u inner product with v. I should get four blue terms, plus the inner product of v with u, plus the inner product of v with v. And now let me do the additivity of the two rightmost terms in the previous line. And I now have u inner product with u minus using the what the homogeneity of the second slot and minus 1 is just going to be conjugated that's going to give me minus 1 so i now have minus or where am i at i'm so lost here oh i'm really doesn't matter what i end up with how so let me just keep going. I now have minus u with v. Is that okay? And then I have minus v with u and a minus a minus a v with v. And I now have two of these and two of these. And what do I have here? I have this guy. And I have this guy. The ones in the blue highlight cancel. The ones in the yellow highlight I can keep, and that just doubles, so that I now have 2 times the norm of u squared plus 2 times the norm of 
of v squared, and that's actually twice then the norm of u squared plus the norm of v squared, and that's what I was setting out to show. And again, I did not have to use a particular definition of the inner product. Now that I have these inequalities and equalities, let's start using those. Let's move into the second section of chapter 6, which is going to be talking now about orthonormal basis. And here we call a list of vectors orthonormal if the vectors are all pairwise orthogonal. So if I look at any two, they're going to be orthogonal to each other. They're pairwise orthogonal and each vector has a norm equal to 1. So that's going to be my orthonormal list. They're pairwise orthogonal and they all of these vectors have a norm of 1. And I can rewrite that another way. In other words, given a list, let's say E1, E sub 2, and now these are vectors. These aren't coordinates of a vector E. These are a vector E1, a vector E sub 2, and a vector up to E sub M. The list is orthonormal if I look at the inner product of E sub i with E sub j, and the only time that's going to be 1 is when the indices are the same. When they're different, it's going to be 0. And so I'll just write that as a delta ij, where this is now the Kronecker delta. By that Kronecker delta, I'm meaning that if I take delta sub ij, then what I'm meaning by that is it's 1 if the indices are the same and it's 0 otherwise. So you give me any vectors in this orthonormal list e1 through e sub m, if I match them up or find their inner product, the only time they are going to be giving me any result that's non-zero is when the indices are the same and that result that they give me has a value of 1 in terms of an inner product. And this is actually quite powerful. These orthonormal lists are particularly useful. And one way of demonstrating that is through Proposition 625, which is now talking about the norm of an orthonormal linear combination. That's the title that 
the book is giving to Proposition 25 in Chapter 6, the norm of an orthonormal linear combination. That just means we are forming vectors from a linear combination of orthonormal vectors. Or, if we have this set of vectors, let's say that we now have E1, E2, E sub n is an orthonormal list. in our vector space V, then if we look at the norm of that, the following vector, A1, E1, plus A sub 2, E sub 2, or I form this new vector that's a linear combination of vectors from that list, and I look at its norm squared, I can easily compute that norm squared by just finding the absolute value of those scalars and squaring those and adding them up. Meaning this is equal to the absolute value of A1 squared plus the absolute value of A sub 2 squared, etc. up to A sub M squared and that's for all scalars A1, A sub 2, a sub n in our field of numbers. How can we show that? Well, now we really get crazy with summations. But let's look at A1, E1. So I'm now simply linearly combining or creating a vector that's a linear combination of these orthonormal vectors, A1 through A sub M, and if I square it, now what's that begging me to do? Taking an inner product, so that so that now, if we look at this inner product, we have A1, E1, plus A sub 2, E sub 2, A sub M, E sub M, with itself. And what is this going to do? Well, let's just do additivity of the first slot. Wow, m different times, right? So we're looking at the summation of a1, e1 with all of these other pieces in the second slot. And those pieces will just index as a sub l, e sub l from l equal 1 to m. That's just the first piece. And then we do that again with the second term. We have summation from L equal 1 to M of A sub 2, E sub 2 with A sub L, E sub L. And do you see that I have to just keep doing that until I do plus the sum from L equal 1 to M of A sub M, E sub M with A sub L, E sub L. And maybe what I will do on my own time is I can now collapse these, right? I can form another summation of these because I'm really now summing over all of these in the first slot. So I'll now have a double summation, but what's going to fall out? Every one of these terms that involves a dissimilar index on the E's is going to vanish, and I'm just going to be left with scaled versions with this, of these scalars with the same index. So I'm going to have a sub 1 times a sub 1 conjugate plus a sub 2 times a sub 2 conjugate, etc. And that's just the norm of that a sub i quantities, the sum of those. That's what I may write down, but 
thank you for being patient and bearing with me as I kept losing my voice during this lecture.